Well, friends, welcome back to this week's episode of YMC Cast. I hope you are doing well, and I hope that you have had uh, a very good week this week. As always with YMC Cast, we start in prayer. Lord, thank you that we are continuing to be able to produce these podcasts because it comes up on nearly a year at this point of uh, doing these podcasts and being able to listen to all these very interesting people talk about the ways that they are working to serve you. May we remember that we do this in your name and for your glory. Amen. And so this week we start with a very important day. Uh, on Monday of this week it was International Women's Day, which is a very important day within the, the life of the world and indeed in the life of the church. In our first interview today we hear from Kathleen Richardson, who was the first ever female district chair in the Methodist Church and also the first ever female president of the conference. Hello and welcome to this video from the Methodist Church to celebrate International Women's Day. With me is the Reverend Dr Kathleen Richardson, also known as Baroness Richardson, who served in the House of Lords for 20 years until she retired in 2018. Kathleen was the first woman to become a chair of district within the Methodist Church and went on to become the first female president of the Methodist Conference in 1992. Hello Kathleen and thank you for joining us. It's a great pleasure. You were ordained in, in 1980. What changes have you seen since then? Well, there were far fewer of us in 1980. Um, I believe I was the first woman with, um, a married woman with children to be accepted for training, although there had been a number of de ex-deaconesses uh, go through into circuits before then. Um, so there were, there were not many of us. Uh, today, I suppose it would be, certainly in the last few years, women are in the majority of people accepted um, as presbyters in the Methodist Church. So there's been a, a huge shift in understanding and appreciation and, and acceptance. Yeah. Did you experience any negativity um, around your ordination? Well, it was difficult to persuade them that certainly somebody who was married with children would have time to do ministry. Um, but, um, and certainly when it came to being um, selected as Methodist chair, uh, there was a lot of negativity. Uh, it was considered that I hadn't spent long enough in ministry. Um, that I, was ne I had never been a superintendent. I couldn't possibly be put into a position of being in authority. Um, but um, the district chair is, is, is a wonderful job. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, but um, yeah, there, were, there were some negative comments and they were rehearsed well in the Methodist recorder of the time. You were the first female district chair and the first female president of the Methodist Conference. Did they feel like momentous occasions at the time? I think so. A great deal, a great fuss was made about it being a first. But to me, it just seemed a logical progression, um, a continuance of the ministry that I uh, set myself into and allowed to happen. It wasn't something that I particularly wanted or certainly sought. I didn't. It was all somebody else's idea um, that had my consent <laughs> in both cases. And it was um, so that I, I never felt I'd got anything to actually prove by being accepted. Uh, it was just one of those things that happened that I agreed to readily. <laughs> that sounds rather strange, but it's true. You mentioned earlier about the negativity. How did you deal with that? Well, I didn't, in a sense, feel it was personal, mostly because those who were negative didn't know me. It was uh, the role that was considered. Um, and because they hadn't seen it happen before, they couldn't see how it was going to work out. So I never felt really angry or aggrieved or it, it didn't affect me in that way. I think, as I was wont to say at the time, well, I might not have voted for me either. Um, so it was, um, yes, it was just simply moving into a role that was, I was being allowed to do and it felt good. 
During the lead up to you becoming um, president of the Methodist Conference, was there a sense that the time had come for a female president? I think it was possibly, the, well, I'm sure it was the right time. By the time I was president in 1992, there had been Methodist women um, in uh, presbyteral roles for 20 years. So I think everybody felt it was the right time. Um, but the, the way it was done in those days, um, the, you had to be nominated and everybody who was nominated was put on the, on the list and people voted in conference and um, the, they took off the, the few who had least votes and voted again until in the end, the last vote, interestingly, there were two women left in the running. So the, the final vote was not about whether it should be a woman or not, because it was going to be a woman, but which of the women uh, was going to be. Um, and I, it didn't really, I didn't really think it would be me, but it was. <laughs> what advice would you give to women who are embarking on a career within the Methodist Church? I think seeing it as a career is quite the wrong word. It's, it's not a career with a, a basis for improvement or getting higher as you go up. It's um, an offering of the gifts that God has given you um, to be used as the church sees best. So we all go into it um, believing that God appointed us to this place at this time and that there's work for us to do. And so, yes, and being a chair or a president is not a higher form of ministry. It's just a different form of obedience. Does that make sense? It certainly does. Reverend Dr. Kathleen Richardson, also known as Baroness Richardson, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. It was really interesting to hear, and thank you, Kathleen, for that. As well, this week, many young people have started heading back into schools uh, following the opening of lockdown. And I think it's kind of a very interesting time, a very stressful time for young people to be heading back into schools. So we're going to hear from several people who are involved with Methodist schools and what it has been like returning to schools for them and what it has been like as teachers and as staff to be involved in the process of bringing young people back into school. Hello everybody and welcome to this uh, interview this morning. Um, my name is Meg and I work for the children, youth and family team of the Methodist Church and today um, I'm joined by a couple of guests and we're going to be reflecting upon the situation as it's evolving at the moment with uh, children and young people returning to schools on Monday. Um, Recognising of course that in different places across the country some children have already been at school for a long time um, for various different reasons. Um, but there'll be a, a whole uh, big number of young people who are this weekend perhaps thinking and worrying possibly about going back to school on Monday. So I'm joined today by uh, two people. Thank you so much for joining us. It's great to have you with us. Uh, firstly, we've got James, James Royal. Uh, James is the executive head of Blackrod Church School, which is up in the, in the northwest. Um, that is one of uh, 66 maintained Methodist schools that we have across the country. Um, and the Methodist Academies and Schools Trust, which we abbreviate to MAST, uh, James also works for them and is the, the school improvement lead. So welcome, James, this morning. And then we're also joined by uh, Jo, Jo Porter, um, who is also a teacher, a uh, Senko at her school, um, but is also a parent um, of two children and attends her local Methodist church. So we're going to have uh, some interesting perspectives this morning. So um, my first question, I guess, for you to kind of think about because you've both been around children and in the preceding months you have a really good understanding of this but what do you think are the main concerns at the moment that that children are perhaps feeling about this return to school whether they've been in school and the kids are coming back in or whether they're going back in for the first time in, in quite a number of months what do you think are are their main concerns James shall we start with you what what do you think about that yeah thank you i think I think in any organizational structure the first the first thoughts that you go to are about routine and structures and, and I think that we we will go from uh, a number of perhaps about eighty children in our school to two hundred and fifty two hundred and sixty so making sure all of those routines uh, are established and all of the health and safety measures are in place are, are key um, but that's just the that's just the tip of the iceberg because I think that the biggest 
the biggest thought for us is to be sure that when we get our children back into the classrooms, the relationships that they will have been managing in a different way are able to blossom and flourish again. And that's the relationships they have with each other and also the relationships that they have with their teachers. Um, we know that happy children are good learning children and that they, they, they develop the best. So before we can get to the point at which we can start thinking about where we want them to be academically, we know that we've got to make sure that they're settled and that they're reformed in those really strong bonds. What, what we found the last time, we're lucky in some ways because we've practiced this once already, we've done a return already and, and, and we can reflect on some of those key bits of learning. What, what, what we found is that actually children form those, reform those bonds really, really quickly. So we're going to make sure we do lots of stuff around um, connection and engagement and collaboration. Uh, and, and I think really when we start to get onto the thinking about learning, we'll focus on the very practical elements of learning that perhaps might not have been quite as possible with resources at home. So the things like singing together or building volcanoes or doing those sorts of great fun things mm -hmm. that we might not have not might not have been able to have an opportunity to do at the expense of doing other brilliant brilliant things as well yeah uh, d d does that does that answer your question yeah I, I think i'm interested also that knowing that there are there have been children in school for as you were saying the key workers children have you picked up on any anxieties that, or concerns that they are having about other people coming back in all of a sudden Yes, I, I, well, anxieties, I think sort of uncertainty probably is, is, mm. is a good phrase. What, what we found from those children in school is that they've loved it. They've loved being in school when it's really quiet, when there's loads of space, when they can do what they want and they can have the football at playtime. They can do all of those things. So helping to reassure them that, that being able to be with their friends again is going to sort of mm. supersede those feelings of, yeah. well, are we all going to fit in kind of a thing. Um, <laughs> but, but again, I think that they are just generally they're sort of they're sort of very quick to fix those issues mm. hopefully and, and, and my my expectation given where we were last time is that yeah as soon as they see their face the faces of their friends again uh, the, the, those worries will be will, will be forgotten very quickly yeah so so joe coming to you obviously you've got children yourself who are returning to school what do you think their concerns are at the moment what are they talking to you about about going back to school um so my eldest daughter is seven so she's in year three and for her, I mean, to be honest, the honest response was is that she wasn't quite sure that it was actually going to happen, that she was actually going to go back to school. She's uh, ended up rather cynical, to be fair, um, and it sort of says, oh, is it really going to happen? Are we going back? I mean, for her, she is very excited. Um, she has had a varied experience for this nearly almost year because she was in, a, in key worker provision. My husband's a police officer. So she's been in key worker provision in the last first lockdown. And then this lockdown, we chose to keep her at home um, because we felt less children needed to be in and I could work remotely. So um, she's had a very varied experience of the whole situation. So we've seen all kinds of emotions from her. But she, this time, I think she just is hoping this is the last time She's going to have to go through this experience of one minute being at school and then the next minute not being at school. And it's like the yo-yo effect of that. Um, and I think she, her nerves are more based around, you know, being around other children all the time because you sort of forget the impact of children being at home. They're almost become just locked. But, you know, they sort of feel trapped in their house and they're very safe and secure in their little family unit that's there. And then they're suddenly back coping with all the social situations and things that go on at school. Um, so I think that's her only wobble. Um, but she is quite looking forward to it. But then, truth be told, like most children, she sort of says, oh, no, I'm going to have to sit for an hour of maths now at school. And this kind of thing. So there's elements where they prefer to be at home. So, yeah. yeah. And my little one is three. Um for her, she is going to start at nursery next week. She could have been in as well for the whole time, but we chose to hold back. Um, and she is really excited to start nursery because the sad thing for her that she's been saying, you know, she, for her living memory this last year, she's things she remembers is only coronavirus related. Yeah. She mm -hmm. thinks everything is about when, when she will just say, when the virus is better, can we do this? and she can't see any other normality. And um, she's got to a point at home where she now is so, it's very sad. She says, 
Well, I make a friend soon, mummy. She wants to make a friend because she's just been around her big sister, you know. And although we've had little bits, haven't we, where we've been able to see people, it's not been anything sustained. And so she... She's actually now, her play has gone towards having imaginary friends and she plays with her imaginary friends in the house. And, Mm. you know, for her, socialisation is really the key now. She's so excited to go to nursery and make some friends. So, you know, it's very mixed in my house. You sort of get that emotional up and down from them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. Thanks for that. So... So, um, so James, obviously, lots of lots of worries or concerns, perhaps from um, from the pupils as well as from the parents. How are schools preparing? How's your school preparing? You know, um, getting ready for this. Sure, there's they're certainly a big job on their hands. I, I would like to say I think that uh, Joe's eldest daughter should go into politics. It sounds like she's got the right um, the, the, the right ideas. Certainly, um, yeah. There are there are lots of things to try and do in these two weeks. It was it, it was really very welcome that the minister had said that he was going to make sure that we we had time to prepare um, because we shut down very, very quickly. You know, within 24 hours, we had to move to a very different sort of provision. Mm. Um, And and certainly in my school, we we decided to take this as a a really really present opportunity to try reset the clock to a certain extent. We know that the, um, you know, that the the person that the government have appointed to oversee what they're terming as catch up um, is is doing a, a, some kind of a review of the, of the broader scope and reach of, of education. But what we want to do is to really, really think carefully about how best to how best to start again. We we want to ensure that we create an environment that kids are really, really engaged with very, very quickly. So that they're walking through the doors and they'll be immersed in imagination and creativity. So that that kind of just sort of hooks them in. We want to be able to get them get them right. And we're, we're thinking very carefully about the use of our language. We're not talking about catch up in my school. We're talking about bouncing back because we think, you know, if, if you're running a race and you know that you've got to catch up, you're never going to get to the front. You know that you're never going to get there. But if, if what you feel that you can do is just bounce back with energy and with momentum, then, then we think that that's a much more positive way of starting again. And we're also mindful that some of the staff need to feel a bit like that too you know we know that some will feel a little bit anxious even though I think most of them are desperate to be back at back, back at work but but we want to be able to create a very energetic and positive environment that's that's practically and tangibly very visual but also emotionally very very encouraging uh, and, and, and very worthwhile in that sense and we're looking as I said earlier on we're looking at making sure that we cover some key bits of English learning and some key bits of maths learning but we're also really, really going to focus on as much of the practical and collaborative learning as we can. Those things that we know that at homes, for, for all of the really brilliant work that they've done, they might just not have had the resources or the capacity to be able to do. So, um, you know, uh, some really, really good quality investigative science work, or getting outside and doing some, some digging around and creating, creating pictures and sculptures and things like that. Um, and finally, really, I think the thing that we're really, really keen to do is to make sure that when we look back on what's happened over the last 12 months, knowing, of course, that it's been really difficult for a lot of children and a lot of families, that there have been some brilliant things that have happened at homes. Kids have learned to do things and to be able uh, and to be involved in sharing times with their parents or other people at home that they wouldn't necessarily have ever had the opportunity to do otherwise. And we want to celebrate that because we know that when you look back on a period of time, if you look back on it negatively, then the energy that you've got to kind of move forward is drained a little bit. And what we want to be able to do is to say, look, there's some amazing things that have happened. You've been able to, you've been able to learn to make an omelette, maybe. You've been able to defrost the fridge, I think was the um, example of things that you, you used, Meg. There are things that have gone on that are great things that kids have been able to do. So we want, we're, we're going to create as much of a display opportunity of, that, of those things too, so that children and adults can see that, Although it's been a different 12 months, it's not been lost, it's not been wasted, it's been really purposeful and valued. Um, and I think, they're the, I think they're the key preparations that we're putting in place alongside the sort of the mechanical operation of things about getting the staffing rotors right and making sure that the bubbles have got somewhere to go at different times of the day and that sort of stuff, which is, which is tough. I suppose that's the stuff I, I enjoy less. The uh, creative stuff and the environmental creation is the thing that I really, really enjoy. And, and uh, we're lucky we've got brilliant staff who are, really really keen to kind of get on board and, and sort of do that in that way great and what about you joe as a as a parent how are you preparing your kids to go back to school 
Um, so I would say, to be honest, I'm not sure as a parent you can fully prepare them. That's the honest answer. I think, you know, I've got two mindsets there. I've got a teacher mind, I've got a parent mind. And when I'm in my home, I'm just a parent, you know, and I can see all the teacher theory behind, you know, all get them all settled, make sure they go to bed on time this week and that they're not going to go back next week feeling um, too tired and that kind of thing. But it's kind of actually, I think parents need to realise that that actually is not always possible. And you, you get a lot of idealistic ideas as a parent about what you should do on a run up. Um, you sort of have to run with how your children are. For me, it's... Um, just saying to the children, right, we're going to go back to school. It is going to feel a bit of a shock to the system because we've all got to get up and get out because the reality of you all being at home, even me working from home, you can like log on and be in your dressing gown and stuff, can't you? And, you just, and nobody knows. So, you know, and um, I think we're just, for me, I'm saying to my daughter, I mean, I was, it's, I totally agree as a teacher with James. So, you know, I hate this phrase catch up program I'm really against all of that I think that's totally wrong mindset for children I just say to my daughters just you're going to go back and have fun and enjoy being around people again you know it's one small step it's a step in the right direction for you of of seeing the world again beyond being at home and um our low you know our walk that we're allowed to do and things locally you know oh this time you can actually see people for a few hours um I think to prepare what what do you do as a parent just I don't know if you can fully prepare them other than just chat to them about it when they need it and just yeah. reassure um I know my daughter worries that she's she finds maths difficult for example and she worries about going back to school and not being quick enough with her times tables because there's this you know pressure that they need to start learning them and she teach the saying you need to know them for year four and this kind of thing and I just say don't worry about it we're all who we are and we've all got our strengths and you're not judged yeah. on this planet whether you know your times tables or not so you know, and my children, you know, I've been working throughout the pandemic. My husband's police, he's been at work. We've done our best to support them at home with learning, but they has been varied. And um, as my children are children of two key workers who haven't been able to protect them from the, from the brunt of what's going on. They've known what's going on. You know, life has been very busy. My husband's done really long hours that have got worse. And my, my daughter, sadly, we both, we got, we all got COVID in January and uh, we, I'm still off work with extreme fatigue from that. So, you know, and, and my husband, so my daughter is going back. I've told her school, she is going back rather wobbly because she's, she has experienced us all getting COVID. And I think sometimes we actually forget that children are coming back um, like the, traumatized in some respects because we're forgetting there are families that have had covid as well and mm. i had to say mm. to her teacher this on monday she is coming back having witnessed me and her dad rather ill and her mm. and her sister were quite ill and she will need some tlc as well yeah. you know and i and i imagine there's probably quite a lot of young people in a similar position to that yeah. Time, who are yeah. coming back in who've had perhaps bereavement and um, yes. you know there's going to be lots of people affected in all sorts of different ways and so. i think that we have to remember that and as a parent i said for me it's more important that she's given some tlc rather than let's now push her with a certain subject because actually they've lived through all kinds of things and i think mm. we have to be supportive and we think how yeah, we yeah. feel as adults we have to think how we feel as well, you know, yeah. how children are feeling. Mm. So we've just got a couple of minutes left to wrap up, but I think there's a really important question to, to perhaps um, to finish with really. And that's, that's the place of faith in all of this. Obviously a, a lot of people watching and listening to this are going to be um, uh, people of faith who go to church. Um, James, you're in a really privileged position in many ways because you're a head teacher, executive head of a, of a church school. So, so faith can play perhaps a bit more of a part in your school than it, than it can in other people's schools. How important do you think that is to the, to the children at this time, um, a time of uncertainty? And um, are you doing anything particular along the faith lines as, as you head back in? Yeah, absolutely. And I think picking up on the point that Joe made at the end there, I think that church schools are in an absolutely brilliant position to be able to 
uh, open their arms with that kind of compassion and love for those those really particular needs that that, that some children are going to have definitely have worked through. I think now is a brilliant time for church schools because because what we need to be able to do is is go very much back to what what drives us on through our values and our vision and and ensure that we recreate or refresh or restart the clock in in the work that we do in our schools very focused on those things that really really matter to us and that is the that is the support and the encouragement and the nurturing of of faithful values within our school you know kind of the, the black pool in the rock so if what what is if what we can do is live out those gospel values every day to support our children we know that what we'll end up doing is getting the best out of them in the end in terms of their academic output so i think I think being being in a church school is a huge advantage in these very difficult times because it gives us a it gives us a bedrock to be able to to to, to grow from and to build from, um, and certainly in terms of the specifics that we're working on, we're going to work really really hard to provide some. We're getting a bit of experts on remote worship at the moment, so we're going to really work hard on creating some some, some interesting and some thoughtful and reflective uh, Zoom worship uh, opportunities. We've got some very clear focuses for the classroom environments. Every one of our classroom environments has got specific opportunities for children to reflect and to share their feelings and thoughts and worries. So we're going to we, we're going to ensure that that's that, that's one of the very key strands of the experience that children have the minute that they walk back in through this door, um, and that they get that they get the opportunity to feel like that that they are fully supported and fully encased in in the love that we want to be able to share with them through the through the foundation that we have as a faith school. That's great. And, and finally, Joe, um, obviously, as, a, as somebody who goes to a Methodist church, do you think there's anything that churches could be doing at this time to support children and young people? Um, I think that church is, you know, just reaching out to the children. Um, I think knowing and understanding them. I think it's been a difficult time for churches to be able to actually continue worship with children. And that's something that I think can be developed. But I think... Um, just the church praying for their children, supporting them. Mm -hmm. And I just agree with James. I actually teach in a church school myself. And I do, you know, I, I think it's about just sharing so that children know they're loved, they're valued, and that we, we live each day with what I say to my own children, with a sense of hope. Um, and that, that's your, like, what keeps you steady as such, you know. Um, and my daughters look around at nature and things and just seeing that hope around them. And it's spring, and I think that's a nice time for that hope to be happening. So I feel that churches can just reach out and just pray and bless their children as they're going on this next journey. That's brilliant. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, I found that a really interesting conversation. So it's been brilliant to have you with us. And just to say to anyone who is watching and listening, if, if you want to do any more advice or guidance, there's loads of things on our website. So do, do check it out and uh, look at all the different organisations that you could turn to for that. But thanks again. And I, I really hope that the return to school goes well on Monday and uh, uh, look forward to chatting with you again at some point in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that really interesting video. And that is all we have for this week's YMC cast. So I hope that you have enjoyed it. As always, please do get in contact with us using the hashtag YMC cast or emailing me Michael YMC worker. It's always great to hear from you. So I hope you've had a really good week and cheerio.